The Leap Foundation proudly presents the Meet the Mentor podcast with Dr. Bill Dorfman. Dr. Bill is a TV host, New York Times bestselling author, two-time Guinness World Book record holder, fitness guru, celebrity cosmetic dentist, and philanthropist who founded the Leap Foundation. Here's Dr. Bill. Hey, Dr. Bill here. So get ready for an exciting Meet the Mentor. But before you do, I just want to let you know that Leap has changed venues. After 16 years, yeah, fight on. I never thought I'd say that. We're going to USC. Uh, Leap this year will be July 21st to the 27th at the beautiful USC campus. And we're super excited. We're, we'll be in the Bing Theater, which is a beautiful big ballroom. Uh, we have a capacity to have over 400 students. We already have confirmations from Anthony Hopkins, from Amy Adams, from Jason Alexander, uh, from Paula Abdul. And we know there'll be many, many more joining us. So it should be a fantastic leap year. And it'll be interesting to be on a, on a different campus. So we're super excited about that. Um, also, if you haven't seen the media, um, we've launched Poof. So if you want to whiten your teeth, um, go ahead and check out Poof, P-O-O-O-F.com on Amazon. It is a dissolving whitening strip that I helped uh, create with uh, my friends at Great Health Works, and it is the bomb. So check out Poof if you want a whiter, brighter smile. Um, with that, I'm going to introduce you to our mentor today. It is Carolyn Goiter. She is an internet. She has an international reputation for her work as a speaker, best-selling author, and coach. Her TEDx on the surprising secret to speaking with confidence has been viewed more than 9.5 million times. That's a lot of views. Caroline is the author of How to Speak with Confidence, Influence, and Authority, her perennial bestseller, and her most recent book, Find Your Voice, unpacks and develops the secrets for speaking with confidence as explored in her hit TEDx talk. She has a degree in English literature from University of Oxford. She speaks at YouTube, Facebook, Amazon, Harvard Business School, and has clients including news anchors, reporters, actors, CEOs, and even a monarch, we have to find out which one, and TV magicians, among many others. Um, she and her team provide coaching across the world, and it is with great pleasure that I introduce you to Caroline. Thank you for joining us on Meet the Mentor. It's lovely to be here, Bill. So you're in London now, right? A cold, wintry London, I'm afraid. Yeah, we're in warm, hot, sunny L.A. Um, so how did you start your career in a, as, a, as a speaker coach? I was the classic. You remember the math teacher at school who was really good at maths and wasn't a great teacher. And then there was the math teacher who hadn't been great at maths, but could really teach. Right. I was the person who when I left university, I went to drama school. And they all said, you're in your head, you've got no presence, you, you're not grounded on stage, you're not listening. And I remember thinking, what on earth do I do with that feedback? Can I change or am I stuck? Is that just me? And I, I worked through that horrible place of feeling stuck. And in learning what I learned the hard way, I've got so much to share with people who are also a bit stuck when they speak. And, and that's really the path. The path has been the difficulty. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to share a personal anecdotal story with you. So, you know, I always tell students, if there's two things that I really want to get through your little noggins when you come to Leap, it's this. Number one, don't wait for opportunities in life, make them. And number two, when you do get an opportunity, don't take it, master it. And there's a big difference. So in my life, I had the amazing opportunity to be the featured dentist on ABC's hit show, Extreme Makeover. Dentistry, no problem. Like I'd been doing dentistry for 15 years. TV, whole different story. Like I literally looked like a deer in headlights. If you watch the first few episodes of the show, it, it, it's, it's, 
painful for me to see myself. But at least I was smart enough to know how bad I was that I did something about it. And what I did was I hired somebody just like you, Ramey Warren Black, and I took acting lessons, uh, voiceover lessons, um, just, I mean, she was a media coach and she would hire professional interviewers to sit with me and interview me. And then she'd hit me in the head, like, sit up straight. Yeah. And, and she just worked with me and worked with me. And the best part of that was she filmed everything. Mm-hmm. So I could actually see how bad I was because I, I honestly think that we are our own worst critics. And watching that made me improve tremendously. I love that. And I I was working with a client today and we spent a lot of time recording her voice on voice notes and also filming her because I think there's two things on that. One is, as you say, Bill, seeing yourself can be a real spur to get better. It, we coach ourselves. But sometimes the other thing I see is that when we film ourselves or record ourselves, actually, we're not as bad as we think we are. And both of those two perspectives can be really helpful to people. So I'm always telling clients, this thing is your own coach. You know, use it, right. film yourself, record yourself. Right. I'm not going to lie. I, I was the opposite. I was worse than I thought I was. <laughs> no joke. I, I, I mean, it was really that bad, but I got better. And, um, you know, my goal was don't get fired. So, um, okay. So you, you, you went to acting school, you thought you would become an actress and then tell me how you kind of segued into the the whole coaching thing. How did I get to where I got to? Well, the, the thing was that, you know, when you see actors on TV, you only really see the actors, don't you? You don't have a sense of the costume people. You don't have a sense of makeup. You definitely don't have a sense of voice coaches or the people who were coaching you, Dr. Bill. And the thing is that I got to drama school thinking I wanted to be an actor. And as I've said, it was quite hard. But the people who were teaching me, the voice teachers, the movement teachers, the acting teachers, the directors, I sat there and I watched them and I went, your job is more interesting than the actor's job. And that's right. I still think that being a producer or a director or a coach, a cinematographer, is the jobs that you don't see in entertainment that are often the most interesting ones. And I would say to anybody who looks at actors or watches TV or looks at great YouTube sites and goes, I love what they're doing, to think about who's making that. You know, like on a great podcast, the sound editor, that's, a, that's also a really fun job. So start right. being really curious about that is what I would say. Okay, but here's the thing. So you had the formal training, right? How did you segue? Like, would you just walk up to an actor and say, you know what, you suck. Can I help you? <laughs> I mean, like, I mean, how did you actually start a business doing it? I mean, at a certain point, I could understand because I've seen a lot of actors say, okay, the acting thing isn't for me. You know, I want to be a producer. I want to be this. I want... But how did you actually break into your current career? Well, do you know what? I was the first one. I was, I ended up teaching drama so often. You, you, we go, we teach after we train. And I, I did jury service and I walked across the River Thames every day to jury service. And I looked at all the people who looked really happy and I didn't really like my teaching job. And I thought to myself, I am going to go train as a voice coach. And so I signed up for, there's a great school called Royal Central School of Speech and Drama, which is quite a mouthful in itself. And I did a one year voice master's. So to anybody thinking, I really want to train professionally, there's usually a master's. And a master's was fabulous because it gave me a network. It gave me a really professional set of skills. And then when I finished, I stayed working there. And I worked at Central School of Speech and Drama for about 10 years. And that was an incredible training and it gave me also real credibility and it gave me when I wanted to leave a real weight in the work I did because I I had the kudos of that building and I think that can be really helpful sometimes I think that's incredibly important and you know a lot of people try to start a business and kind of create their accolades or, but to actually have worked for 10 years at such a prestigious 
you know, foundation would definitely, definitely give you the credibility. So it's kind of the old saying, you need the steak and the sizzle, right? So now you have the steak, you know your craft. How did you actually start a business and how did you start getting clients and all that? Lots of people ask that question about starting a business. And I think you probably know, Dr. Bill, as well as I do, that sometimes it's good to be magnetic. You know, we can push stuff out at people, but actually I was working at Central and I started to do three days a week. And then I had this space and people would start to approach me separately because they say, oh, someone told me about some work you did with X. And so the business really started to build itself like a magnet. And slowly there was so many, you know, pieces of metal attached to the magnet that I had to take on a team and I had to, you know, build a website. But actually it was the referrals and the interest first because then I had that energy. I had that momentum. And I think... Sorry, at LEAP, we call it ABM, always be marketing. So you were marketing and networking, but I mean, did you actually, like, what was your, what was your very first client that like actual client who said, Caroline, I'm going to pay you and you're going to work with me. Who, who was that? God, that's a good question. I'm not sure if I can remember. I suspect that my very first client, because I was teaching in and around drama school. So I think my first client was probably an actor who wanted to work on a speech, but I can't remember, which is terrible. There was a lot of kind of, I started off really working with actors and coaching them on speeches and confidence and auditions. And then slowly, I think as I got older, actually, I think, in the corporate world, age is quite good. You know, the very few spheres where that's true. But as I became older and wiser, I think then the corporate world started to approach. And actually, that was the bit that interested me because I like people saying their own words. I find that quite interesting. Actors are great, but they're saying someone else's words. Yeah. You know, I'll tell you something. The the voice coaching and training I got from Ramey Warren changed my life. It, it really did in in so many different ways. I, I mean, even I would say if you don't think you're going to be a professional speaker, I feel like everybody should have this training because it resonates in everything you do. You know, I mean, no matter what profession you're in, you're in sales. You need to sell yourself. I mean, I'm a dentist. You know, you say, well, are you? In sales? Yeah, I'm selling dentistry you know, and um, it, it's, it, if you learn how to master it, it is so incredibly empowering as well. I'm such a nerd about it. I absolutely agree that we should all be taught it at six, you know, because with a dentistry background, you know exactly the physiology of speech, right? It's, you know, it's part of what you learn. And most people don't know that voice is exhaled air. They don't think about how the articulators shape speech. And when you understand that the voice is exhaled air and that your pause is in breath, what you realize is you've got nervous system mastery at your fingertips, right? Because if you understand that if you mouth breathe a lot, you know, people who speak like this and they pull the air in and it's really noisy. And I bet Remy taught you that one not to do that. That really ramps up our nervous system. It's like really putting the accelerator on really hard. And when we learn that if you close your mouth on a pause and you breathe a lovely smell, you take your time, then that's like a break on the nervous system. And I love watching people realize this. And the person who hated public speaking goes, well, I can be conversational. And you're like, yeah, you can. And I'll tell you for me, what was the greatest epiphany? A lot of people are scared to death to like be interviewed, right? Because, oh my gosh, what is she going to ask me, right? But when I realized that as the interviewee, I'm actually in control, not the interviewer, it changed everything. And, And I'll tell you how she taught me this. I thought it was genius. She said, Dr. Bill, write out three questions you never want to be asked on TV. Okay. Okay. Question number one, what's your net worth? (laughs) 
Like, can you imagine like if you're on the morning show and they go, wow, Dr. Bill, you're really successful. How much are you worth? Like, I, I would like <laughs> freak out. Okay. But here's the thing that she taught me that was so empowering. Don't ever answer a question you don't want to answer. Just change the subject. So if you were to say, hey, Caroline, if Caroline would say, hey, Dr. Bill, what's your net worth? I say, you know what? My net worth isn't the important thing. What is important is how much I give back. Boom. You just turn something from a really potentially negative thing to something really positive because people want to hear how much you give back. You know, they like that, you know? And so... You know, and one of my favorite things is sometimes you get interviewed by ninnies, like by real idiots. And they'll ask you and you're in your head. You're thinking that's the stupidest question. And then all I simply say is, you know what? That's not important. But what is important? And then so I think being prepared and going into an interview, knowing what you want to convey is so important. And even if the interviewer doesn't ask you that, stick it in there. It's that feeling of control, isn't it? We're always in totally. control. Totally. Totally. It's, it's crucial. And it's it's a lot about how we center ourselves through that. And I love voice because it, like you were taught, yes, control the messaging and also control how you show up. Because if you're feeling relaxed, your frontal cortex is going to pull down the information you need. As soon as we're oh. not relaxed, totally. it's all over. It's hideous. All right. Give me your biggest success story. The biggest bit. You don't have to tell the name because I know that that would embarrass somebody. But just make a, a hypothetical name, John or Linda or whoever it was. But give me your biggest, biggest success story as a coach. One that really comes to mind is a lovely exec in New York City who had got a big job where she was having to talk on big stages, like 4,000 people, 5,000 people. And she said, when I, I was at school and I did a speech and I forgot my lines and everybody laughed at me in class. And she said, for the whole of my career, you know, this long, long career, very, very senior person, I haven't spoken. I've got, I've delegated it. Like I've got a big team of 800. One of them will do it for me. She said, I've got to the point, I can't do that anymore. And we went from this point of like, rabbit in the headlights, like hell's mouth opening is what my drama school teacher used to call it, to a place where she can confidently, she doesn't need me anymore. She can confidently command a stage. She can walk out. She can be conversational. She can tell her stories. 4,000 people, no problem. And that it was that's such a lovely journey because it's someone going, I can't do this to you know what? Here I am, Orlando, big conference, 4,000 people. It's all fine. What, uh, what, 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 what was the secret? What was it that you were able to work on with her to transform her? It's, it's, I, well, so I'm an introvert. That's the first thing to say. And I think my secret source is that I help introverts realize that they can be on stage without having to be Tony Robbins. You know, it's that it's like Susan Cain, Brené Brown, that kind of quiet power. And most introverts don't realize that you can be a great speaker from introversion. And I think a lot of the time what I do, which is different to other speaker coaches, is say to someone, be you. And now I'm going to show you how to expand that you. So you pull 4000 people in. But it doesn't mean I mean, I love Tony Robbins. He's awesome. But it doesn't mean becoming him. Uh, He's doing you know his what? thing. You are so right. There are speakers. I mean, there's a guy who comes to leap every single year, Jonathan Sprinkles. And every time before he gets on stage, I tell the students, this man is my favorite and the greatest speaker I ever listened to. I could never be him. I, I am not. I, I No matter how hard I tried, I can't be as cool and handsome and debonair and all the things that Jonathan Sprinkles is, that's not Dr. Bill. I have a different angle. My angle works for me, but his angle works for him. And I think you're right. We just need to find our angle. And I'll tell you another thing that I found was incredibly empowering. We've all heard the saying, practice makes 
Perfect. Wrong. Practice <laughs> makes permanent. Yeah. What neurons that wire together fire together. Right. So the 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 secret is practice, practice, practice. Right. And if you keep practicing the wrong way, you'll get really good at doing it the wrong way. It won't get perfect. Practice makes permanent. So keep practicing. Like you said, you know, take this thing out and view yourself, watch yourself and and keep modifying and keep doing it. And I'll tell you something. I, I've been interviewed oh, over a thousand times and my publicist will call me and say, oh, you have an interview tomorrow. You know, here, here are the questions. I'm like, I don't even need to look at the questions. There is no question you can ask me that I A, haven't been asked before or B, can't answer. That, none. I'd rather not see them. I'd rather just be spontaneous and off the cuff. And just like, I didn't sit down and write out, oh, let me write a bunch of questions for Caroline. Like, I just, we're just going to talk and see where it goes, you know? And I think when you get to the point where you can do as your advice was just be you, I think it comes out so much more authentic and engaging, right? And I love that paradox that, being us on stage comes out of the practice makes permanent. And I think that a lot of people who fear public speaking and think I couldn't do that, they it's like the the practice makes permanent is an iceberg that's so big under the water that they're not seeing. And I, I say to all the people I work with, the great speakers you see, they're working at it. It might be that they worked at it 20 years ago. And like you're saying, Dr. Bill, it's all now in the muscle. But somewhere along the line, they did the work. And if you're scared, if you're nervous, just do the work. I still do stuff daily. You know, I, I still move daily. I still think about my voice every day because it is also about keeping things in the muscle. But it doesn't have to take time. You can do it in 10 minutes if you need to. Right. But I also think probably for me and, and your clients, too, watching yourself and being critical and really seeing what works and what doesn't work is really, really empowering. And, you know, for when I was building my company, Discus, I was on the road almost every weekend speaking to hundreds of dentists. And I gave the same eight hour speech every week. And I knew exactly when they would laugh, when they would cry, when they would, you know, because it's predictable. And so, you know, again, practice makes permanent, you know, keep doing it until you get that level of comfort. And I think there's something in, I love in what you said about some, what things work and what things don't. Because I think one of the things that people get wrong is that sometimes they just, you know, it's easier to hear the bad stuff, isn't it? I think often people hone in on the bad stuff. And I've started to do when I work with groups, I get people to take a pad of post-its each. And when someone stands up to speak, everybody writes down something, a few things that they love about what that person's just done. And then they all hand the post-its to the person who's just spoken. And the person okay. stands there quietly and they read the post-its of love. And something happens in that moment to their breath. They soften, their faces relax. And later on, they'll write to me and say, I found that day really hard, but just reading through what everybody liked made me realize that maybe I wasn't such a bad speaker. And then from that place of maybe it's okay, maybe I'm okay, that's when you can improve. So there's something about, it's so important to know what we need to work on, right? And at the same time, it's like, give yourself a bit of a hug first, because when we're scared defensive when we feel nervous we don't we don't do our best so find the things that you know you do well and then get better two things together i love that i love that all right so we're going to switch gears for a second i love what you do um if i'm a student watching this and i want to emulate caroline's career you know, what do you recommend? I go to acting school and then, I mean, give me like kind of a little roadmap of what I could do to kind of get into your profession. The first thing I'd say is if there's any offer of drama training or singing training or choir at your school or college, take it up. You know, learn the basics of acting, singing, movement. And then if you feel like you love it, look up the drama schools. And don't just look at the acting courses because you might see a great stage management course or a great movement teacher course. 
start thinking about what would I be interested in learning? And then I would say, yeah, go go learn the practice. Because like dentistry, there is, well, there's probably less theory than in dentistry. But, you know, even in drama training, there's a good amount of theory that you need to get under your belt, especially if you want to teach voice or movement. And with that training in place, you will then know what part of the industry you want to work in. Do you want to go teach actors dialect? Do you want to teach people how to speak clearly? Do you want to be a voice coach? Perhaps you might want to be a theatre director or a movie director from it. But I think. I would always say go seek out the best training at the highest caliber institution you can find and then decide what you want to do from there. Because as you've said, Dr. Bill, the creds of having trained and worked in a place that has real solidity is so important. And it also yep. helps you see what you want from your career. I agree 100%. Thank you so much. This was so enlightening and so much fun. If students want to reach you um, on Instagram and Twitter, it is at Caroline E G O Y D E R. And on YouTube, you've got your own um, YouTube channel, um, Carolyn Goiter Vocal Coach. Um, thank you so much. And um, I loved it. This was so much fun. I've loved chatting, Dr. Bill. And what I would say to anybody listening is we do a confidence booster audio course, which is my present, and it will help you with calm, credibility, clarity. And all you have to do is go onto my site and look for the confidence booster audio course, and we will send it to you. And the site is your website. CarolineGoida.com. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much. Dr. Bill, over and out. To learn more about the Leap Foundation, Go to LeapFoundation.com or find us on Facebook at Facebook.com slash LeapFoundation or on Instagram at LeapFoundation. Listen to the Meet the Mentor podcast with Dr. Bill Dorfman on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast.